Okay, thanks so much for um, you know coming back to your seats. Um, before I introduce our next panel, I just wanted to say if you are posting anything on any type of social media, please use the hashtag ANC22, a student national conference 2022. Um, so much appreciated, just so we can find each other later and, and look at the pictures together or the tweets or whatever it may be. Um, but yes, in our next panel, panelists will explore the connections between memory and identity by reflecting on the stories of the Assyrian genocide survivors and their descendants. They will examine the deep sense of responsibility to preserve the memory of these events and share these stories with the world and future generations. And moderating this panel will be Jamie Bahuda. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, hello again. I, I spoke with you all a bit earlier, so I'm, I'm really happy to be back on stage with my, my two panelists. Um, to kick us off, I think it's really important that we reflect on uh, that poll question that we had right before lunch to see that 75% of people in the room responded that their family has a genocide story. And I think if we look further into the community, that number grows even larger. And I think that's something that's just, it's so impactful and it's really just indicative of what our community has faced and individuals and families in the past. Today, um, we want to explore those connections between memory and identity by reflecting on these genocide stories and examining the impact of geno genocide on our identity, both personally and as a collective. So I'm joined here by two amazing panelists, Jordan Jonas and Mariam Georges, um, who will speak on their own experiences with genocide uh, and ideas around its effect on our identity. So if we can give them a hand, please. <laughs> We're going to be a little casual. This is my Oprah moment. <laughs> um, so You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> awesome. So um, we'll give a moment for our panelists to, to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Jordan Jonas. Um, and my dad is an Assyrian. My mom was not. but. The, uh, I spent, I mean, I'm sure I just make it brief. I spent a, a lot of years living in Russia, among other places, and I lived amongst um, a pretty, you know, a pretty unique bunch of people. They were nomadic reindeer herders, like in the indigenous people of Siberia. And so I spent many years living with them out in the wilderness, basically. And uh, that opened some doors for me to get on uh, this. TV show called Alone on the History Channel. It's where they take you and drop you off in the wilderness by yourself. You film yourself and they basically have a little button and it's whoever lasts the longest. You know, there's 10 people thrown in different areas and you just have real basic tools like an ax and a, you know, a sleeping bag and a pan. You know, just some real basic tools and whoever lasts the longest wins and uh, I was able to last the longest that season. So that was uh, pretty neat. But that uh, <laughs> opened up a lot of opportunities to uh, share about, I mean, the resilience that was given to me through my grandparents and that uh, honestly put my whole experience on alone into so much perspective that I can say it actually wasn't that hard. Because I was just like, man, I have so much to compare it to. I'm like, uh, no, so anyway, we can, we'll talk more about it, but that's a brief uh, history of who I am. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan. Mariam? Uh, Lehu. I'm not famous like Jordan. Uh, <laughs> my name is Maria Guargues. Um, I was born in Iraq. We, my family, my mom is from Mosul, uh, but she is Western Syriac, uh, Soroyo, and my dad is from Enishk in the north of what's today called Iraq. And um, I left Iraq in the 90s, so I was about nine years old. 
Uh, and then I um, arrived in Canada as a refugee, where I was very grateful to um, you know, uh, make a safe home on the uh, indigenous uh, territory of the Michisagig Nishnabe and the Haudenosaunee. So that's where I was raised. That's today called Hamilton, Ontario in Canada. Um, I went on to study and of course through my own lived experiences I wanted to understand more of my family stories so I ended up in political science and I have a PhD in political science from the University of Alberta. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Manitoba uh, where I basically broadly my work is on global indigenous politics and I study Assyrians um, in Southwest Asia. Um, and I'm very... We have two famous people on no. the panel, come on. <laughs> That's true. Awesome. All right, well, thank you all for uh, your introductions and thanks everyone for, for the warm welcomes to our panelists. So I think uh, we'll get started. I, you know, we, we've had, I think, a bit of a heavy day today, you know, a lot of conversations around genocide and uh, you know, seeing Grace was, was really impactful. I, I cry every time. It's, it's without fail, I think, the, the impact it has. But, you know, these conversations, are, they're really vital. So I think it's, it's important. It's ingrained in our identity. It's ingrained in our history. And uh, as hard as they may be, uh, we, we have to talk about it. So I'm excited that you guys are, are joining us so that we can explore it more. Um, we'll kick off, I think, with Jordan. You, you briefly touched upon your family history uh, in your introduction, but uh, please do expand on that. You know, you, your, your history includes some really horrific stories from the Assyrian genocide. And I think yeah, my, um, my grandma and grandpa were both from the Ermia region in Iran. Uh, um, and they're both, they, they both, my grandma and grandpa, went through the genocide themselves. My grandma, grandpa was 17 and my grandma was 13. So they were pretty old when they had my dad. So <laughs> I kind of spread the generation out. But um, yeah, they have some pretty crazy stories. On my, my dad's side, or my grandpa's side, he, um, his father was in a wheelchair. And you know, the Ottomans were coming in and, and they were burning the whole village. And, and he told my grandpa, he like basically, he couldn't run. He was in a wheelchair. They don't know what happened. They couldn't find his sister. So I don't know what happened to my grandpa's sister, but they shove, he shoved a, like a money belt under my grandpa's coat and told him to just run and don't look back. And he's, so he ran out and of course looked back to see the house in flames or whatever. But then he made it and eventually just ran and got to this refugee camp, was eventually taken in by uh, Jesuit, some Jesuit missionaries or something, and then he, uh, so he was raised by them as an orphan. He did have, the only other surviving relative that I know of his was his brother's son, so his nephew, was named Zaya Dashtu, and he was the, became a pre, you know, he's the archbishop of the Ermia region in the 50s and the 60s. I have some, I've met Assyrians who who knew him, which is kind of fun. So my family name would have been Dash too, but the friends chopped that off. But the, uh, my grandma's side also, they, she was also in Urmia. They came in and took her, her dad and all, you know, all the men took him off. And uh, she and her eight children were driven out into the desert. This is my great grandmother. My grandma was one of them, she was 13, and all of her siblings except one died in the desert. And when their the baby finally died, like their mom just collapsed and said, I can't go any further. And my mom, or my grandma Shalom, like, they like picked her up with her sister Shushan and they like took her, t like dragged her on and they actually stumbled upon a British military camp and were saved. And I, I don't think Shushan, my aunt or whatever, or, or my great-grandmother ever, ever really recovered, but my grandma did. And, uh, and it was, it's, a, it's amazing. Those, those are the stories in brief. You know, then they, they met grandma and grandpa in Baghdad, and then they went to France right before World War II and went through that whole event, you know, all that. And so they finally came to America and were, um, just loved it because, of course, they were finally uh, safe. But... Uh, uh, but what strikes me the most is how much grandma and grandpa went through. They had 11, then they had 11 kids, one of them my dad, but they, 
they were such joyful people and it spread so much into my aunts and uncles that even my, all my aunts and uncles were just, we didn't grow up around other Assyrians, but up in North Idaho up there where I grew up, it was just like everybody loved, you know, my whole f extended family because they were such joyful people. And it's like, wow, i always been struck by that. How can, how can one generation removed from the most horrible things you can imagine? These people, they weren't defined by who they were mad at. They weren't defined by like how bad, you know, life had been for them. They were just defined by joy and family and sharing. And, and honestly, I had to kind of dig those stories up as I'm sure so many people do because it was, um, they were, they, it didn't quite define them, which was, which is interesting. And, uh, but it's, but it's been so enriching for me to know because, I mean, it's, it's we'll get to that more later too, but uh, that's the brief overview and I'm really thankful for my Assyrian heritage and uh, yeah. Yeah, very wow, good. it's very powerful. It's, uh, <laughs> it's heart wrenching to say the least. You know the yeah, stories of, of all that they went through, but um, hearing about you know the, the outcome and how you view your family is it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty neat that you can <laughs> overcome that yeah. in a positive manner. Yeah, yeah. I think Dr. Guergis, Yeah. We got to do official. Just Mariam. Okay, fine. Mariam, uh, so you know, we when we talk about genocides that have targeted Assyrians, you know, a lot of times we're we're focused on measurable impacts. Uh, you know, how many victims, how many people are displaced, how many villages were were burned, and, and homes as well. Um, but we we don't have many conversations about you know the long term effects and the way that genocide, you know, impacts or, or sometimes even destroys our identity. Uh, so I want, I want to talk with you about, you know, in what ways has, has genocide, genocide aff affected the Assyrian identity? That's a very good question. I'll start off by saying that for me, uh, genocide has had an immeasurable intergenerational uh, impact on the Assyrian identity. That's not to say that that's not something that you can move past. It's just to say that that's been its impact. Um, I want to start off by uh, a quote from, uh, she's a Michi Sagig Nishnabe woman, Leanne Simpson, from Canada. And I just want to see from your faces how much this resonates with you. And that's the only reason I'm starting off with a quote. The primary way my ancestors and I have interacted with the state, so she's talking about Canada, is through dispossession, the removal of indigenous bodies from indigenous lands. My disconnection from indigenous thought, languages, and practices has been orchestrated by dispossession, as had the erasure of indigenous bodies from the present. This is a dispossession of every meaningful relationship from my life. So think about the fact that we're all sitting here on the stolen indigenous land far away from our own ancestral homeland, speaking in English. Think about how some of us in this room only speak Arabic or Farsi or Turkish or any other diaspora language where we ended up. Because our language was stolen from us, and these languages were imposed on us through assimilation policies that were very aggressive and had a very particular aim to eradicate us, to wipe us out. Think about how some of us have never been on our traditional territories or only speak English, Dutch, Spanish, French. Think about, think about how some of us have come to only identify with our religious denomination, Chaldean, Syriac, of Christianity rather than as Ashurae, as Assyrians. Even worse, we fought long and hard amongst each other about our name. And that division is not organic to us. That too has served a specific purpose, which is to divide and conquer us, and it is also part of colonization. So if there are no more Assyrians, 
they can't pose a threat to an Arab Iraq, a Turkish Turkey, whatever kind of hom homogenizing identity Iran has been undergoing uh, in Iran, and then an Arab Syria, right? Mm -hmm. So the Assyrian identity has been very formative in shaping who I am. My earliest memory of my country of origin of Iraq is the sounds of war, as I'm sure many of you have. My earliest collective memory as an Assyrian is that of a land lost, a people scattered, a nation divided by artificial borders, but also a survival of resistance and a refusal to be erased. So that's also part of the impact of genocide, right? We always remember the first part, which is trauma, and then we forget to remind ourselves that actually we have constantly refused to be erased. We're very stubborn like that. <laughs> and that can only come from being persecuted, dislocated, dispossessed, and a struggle to survive these things. And I'll end there for now. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Indeed. I think it's, it's, it's an amazing way to put it um, that we don't often think about you know, how it, it brings us together in a sense and how we, we unite under that as well because we, you know, it's obviously horrifying and it's, it's, it's a terrible thing that has happened to us but it, it's, it's, we unify because we're stubborn and, and that's where we have the power. We gotta, we gotta overcome the, the splinters. Um, yeah. So I think going Going back a little bit, um, Mariam, can you talk a little bit, you know, about more about those lasting impacts of genocide that are experienced by Assyrians today, you know, in the traditional homeland as well as in diaspora? I think there's incredibly serious impacts, right, that are experienced by Assyrians today in both locations, in the diaspora and the homeland. To be Assyrian is often to speak from a place of pain, an open wound, a collective wound of displacement, genocide, assimilation, regardless of where you are. So whether you're in the diaspora or in the homeland. For Assyrians in the homeland, I think, and I'm speaking as someone who is not now in the homeland, right? So there's also that disconnect there and that has to be acknowledged. It means a constant survival mode, right? It doesn't let you focus on other things, and yet they still somehow do, like resurgence, right? So any and all these activities that revive the Assyrian identity and culture, which you'll hear about tomorrow, those are all resurgent practices that Assyrians do in the homeland to maintain who they are. But it also means a distrust, and rightfully so. We heard earlier about how the Peshmerga basically left Assyrians and others defenseless, a distrust of surrounding nations, right? They've been very terrible neighbors slash colonizers. Um, and that doesn't really let us, this distrust, and because it's ongoing, it doesn't let us move beyond this binary of native or indigenous settler colonizer, right? And so you don't see too many uh, at least in Iraq, which is the country I focus on, too many actual uh, meaningful um, working together to kind of create um, a sovereign nation-to-nation -nation relationship, uh, especially in the north of Iraq, I will say that. So, um, but a series in the diaspora, you're also in survival mode. Right? So many of us were prepared for this pandemic. We weren't rushing out to buy toilet paper. <laughs> Our parents have a whole machzan of, I don't know about you, but <laughs> just a lot of canned goods. Because <laughs> we've had to survive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Of genocide, we've had to survive displacement, constant displacement. I was displaced many times before I ended up in Canada. We've had to survive migration. It's not easy to, at 10 years old, start interpreting things for your parents, right? Um, so Assyrians in the diaspora are also dealing with PTSD from this trauma, which we've never processed. 
you know, anxiety, other mental health issues, which we don't often talk about. Um, and we've never really been given the tools to name these experiences so that we can process them and move on with resurgent practices like reviving ourselves, right? This is why sorry, I just messed that up. Uh, it's so important because we have to first create these spaces for ourselves to process what has happened to us, what is still happening to us, right? Before we can move forward to get out of survival mode, to now thrive, to now revive ourselves, to be basically, to have this indigenous resurgence that we keep hearing other nations talk about. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> it's, there's so many, there are all these questions, there's so many to things so to talk yeah, about, but yeah, we can I also don't want to keep taking up so much space. No, it's so. okay, we, we'd love to hear about yeah, it. Good stuff. Um, I think touching a bit on, on what you said, Mediam, I, I would like to ask Jordan, you know, how, how do you think, you know, your family history personally and those stories of survival have, have shaped you are and how have you come to terms with that and, and how you understand your cultural identity? Yeah, it, it's interesting that I probably think about it every day. You know, like it's, it, it, I, um, I relate my own experience to the stories and the experiences of my ancestors and, and I, uh, and again, it's like uh, we're, we're all going to face hardship and trials and, and, and just, you know, my own dad, he's passed and watching him go through a very long, dragged out, kind of miserable death with joy was just like a microcosm of what, uh, it was just like, wow, there's such a beauty there. And, I, and it's what I always come back to is, man, how do we prepare ourselves to deal with the suffering with joy, and uh, you know, and I and I, um, I think about it a lot. So I think about it every day, and that is mostly, you know, very much informed by my um, Assyrian history and the stories I've been shared, and the people who were forged in those situations and what they've passed to me. It's it's, uh, but yeah, it's it's invaluable. But it and it puts into perspective. I mean, it helps me also dwell in this place of gratitude, right? Because we are. Man, we have so much, like, and and uh, so it's it's hard for me to complain about anything, honestly, which is uh, <laughs> an advantage in life. <laughs> but I, uh, uh, so I, I honestly think about it every day. I think, and I, I'm thankful to it every day to my grandma, grandpa, dad, all, you know, all the people mm -hmm. that went through that stuff. Um, and I will say, I'm really. Uh, maybe I'll talk a little more later too, but I'm really grateful to all of you who, because so much of us in the diaspora what, are a little bit disconnected from Assyrian culture, and I've lived with, amongst indigenous people a lot in Siberia, um, and I see a dynamic very clearly that with those, you know, they're more like you would envision Native Americans. You know, it's like a, a nomadic culture, but it's also struggling to make it through. and. Not everybody chooses that way of life. Not everybody chooses to be really relate to their Assyrian heritage, or in my, the case that I witnessed to their Evenki heritage. But as long as some people do, and as long as some people hold the core, and everybody does a little bit, for those people like myself who are interested and who do want to honor that tradition, it's still there and available for us to like um, dive into. So it's really important to maintain it and not and maybe not even have animosity for the people who don't, but just uh, do your part to enrich and create and go forward and make that attractive to the uh, others. But anyway, yeah. a few thoughts. No, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I think touching on, on what you were saying, um, uh, the importance of, of exploring that and keeping it alive, play with, with the sharing of the stories of, of mm, the genocide. Mm. And you mentioned earlier that it was sort of hard to get out of your family. Uh, would you be able to talk about you know, how those stories were shared with yeah, you? Yeah, you know, fortunately, my, I had one aunt, Aunt Georgette, and she was really into it all. And so she wrote it down and forced all her brothers and sisters yeah. to write their stories down. Yeah. And so now I have a whole pamphlet that's just all my, that side of the family's memories and histories um of course like so many of us it's like it's 
too short. It only goes back to my grandpa, and, mm -hmm. and beyond that, I don't know. And the lines cut in every direction, you know. Like yeah. so, uh, but of my immediate family, it's just it's. I'm so thankful to it. And I would I'll tell my aunt all the time. You know, I'd always ask her more detailed questions, mm -hmm. how they went through World War II, how they went yeah. through all this stuff, and. She was very open with it, and she was very active about getting that information from everybody in the family, which is now a big benefit to me, and it will yeah. be to my kids, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so. that's amazing. I think it's amazing. And so you do intend to share them with your, oh, your yeah, future Oh, yeah, we always do, and, and we already do, you know, yeah. always telling the kids about it. Wow. <laughs> that is beautiful. Um, I think taking a little bit of a step back, you know, we've, we've talked about the personal experiences with genocide and the... the the effects on identity. Um, Mariam, I, I did want to ask you, you know, could you talk about, you know, why genocide occurs and why indigenous groups are, are often targets? Uh, you know, why have we as Assyrians just been caught in this, this cycle of genocide for, for hun seemingly, you know, a century? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so every case of genocide does have its own context, its own political, social, historical context, and every case tells us something different. But, and this is what my research is on, there's something that we can generalize about this experience, which is that there has not been one modern nation state that has been made in the modern world without first removing its indigenous inhabitants. Think about that. So I know a lot of us think a lot about our religion and that comes into play obviously in different contexts and that's important to think about. But when you step outside of us, right? When you look at the global making of the modern nation state, each one has involved the removal of indigenous inhabitants in a very targeted, systematic, systemic structural way and that's because nationalism and the making of a state are intertwined you make a state by making a nation all of us are one and everyone on the outside is a threat to that i'm, tr I'm obviously trying to simplify uh something that is very complex mm -hmm. right and so this is how modern nationalism functions it's organized racism, basically. So you have, you can't make an Iraq, especially an Arab Iraq, without removing Assyrians. They'll always be there to say, hey, we're not Arab. So they'll always be that threat to your nationalism. So they have to go. And this is not a game of like ideologies or nations. This is about land. So you always have to remember this. This is, it doesn't matter what tools or instruments or something gets politicized like religion, like identity or whatever. It's always about land. Land is life. Land is resources. Land is where our identity comes from. All of the Assyrian identity is forged in relation to that specific land, right? And so, you have to be able, if you want to create an Iraq or a Syria or a Turkey or an Iran, you have to take that land and you have to make it. Whatever instrument you're using, nationalism, identity, whatever, you have to take that over because it's also worth money. It's worth billions of dollars, this land, because of oil. Or in the case of here, in oil or minerals or resources, whatever it is, right? And so, I don't want us to think about genocide as something that's in the past. Genocidal practices, colonialism, our colonization is ongoing. Right now, the Kurdistan region of Iraq, or what they're calling it as that, is in fact just occupied Assyria. That's what it is. So, this is the ongoing colonization of my village in, of Enishk in the north, of many other villages, right? 
it has to it keeps going until these states are forged and even when they are forged the first thing iraq did when it became a state and was liber uh, liberated from the british mandate was what simil right to forge their arab identity they killed off a series who refused to be called anything else right and so we have to think about this as ongoing land theft and that's what our our goal shouldn't be to say well I'm going to keep calling this now the Kurdistan region of Iraq. I'm going to refuse this title, and if I have to use it to be coherent or legible, I'm going to say what is today known as the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Right? Because it is Beth Nahrin, and it will always be Beth Nahrin if we see it as that. If we call it that. The naming of spaces is very important. And a part of decolonization has to be land repatriation. And it has to mean us using our names for those lands, not refusing to call them by any other name. Right? And I think that's really important uh, to, to keep in mind about genocide. It's not that we are Christian. We're not being removed because we are Christians. Saddam didn't care whether we were Christians, as long as we called ourselves Arabs. We're being removed for being a Syrian, even if religion comes into play. And if you connect that experience, ongoing experience, to other indigenous groups across the globe, you will see that your story is not unique. You have a shared experience with other indigenous groups all around the world who are still ongoing, experiencing ongoing genocide and ongoing colonization of the land we're today meeting on and all of us are from in the diaspora, and we have to make those connections in order to move forward, in order to revive ourselves, I think. I'll stop there. Wow. I have very little to add, because that was so very <laughs> powerful. Um, but I, I think it raises a good question. You know, we're, we're sitting here trying to talk about the effects of genocide on our identity, but you have you've a very profound point that the genocide hasn't stopped. We're in survival mode, and how can we try to assess the effects on our identity when we're not even past it. It's, it's ongoing and it's, it's something that I think is, is important for us to think about and discuss and I'm, I'm glad we are today. Um, I just do have a few, few more questions to get through um, and, and hear more from you, know, you Mariam, and, and your story, jo Jordan, as well. Uh, so I want to go back to you know Jordan your experience uh, you you spent time in, in Siberia you mentioned your experiences with the indigenous Venki people mm -hmm. and how it was important to you and that you felt that connection with that land uh, mm -hmm. and you know I think it's it's profound that your journey led you there knowing that tens of thousands of Syrians were exiled to si Siberia and tragically died uh, there of starvation and disease. So, you know, your story in some sense, returning there as the descendant of, of survivors, um, could be seen as one of triumph of, of some sort. So I guess, how do you process that, that connection? And, and would you say, you know, I think you, you've alluded to it a little bit, but that your family stories did influence uh, you when you competed on alone? Yeah. The, the, um, it was interesting going to Siberia, and it was actually interesting finding there are, you know, there's a pretty robust Assyrian community in parts of Russia, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the, um, but going to Siberia, uh, maybe I'll touch on a similar theme again, maybe it's beating a dead horse, but I, I, it's a place of, you think of like gulags and death camps and this and that, but um, honestly, over time, I grew to see it as like a place of like beauty and of something I really appreciated. You know, like I, I could really see the beauty in that place. And um, I feel like when you go through something like a genocide, when you go through such trial, um, in order to not get lost and to, you know, wiped away, is you have to keep seeing beauty, keep creating, keep moving forward. It's, it's very similar in. It's, it's funny because the, what I, one of the neat things about the wilderness is the lessons you learn are applicable on any level. So wilderness life is very simple and the solutions are very simple, but it almost you can extrapolate it all the way up the ladder to global issues almost. But, uh, you know, you, get a, you run into 
you run into a problem, you have something that's in front of you, a wolverine's attacking, <laughs> you know, you have, you have something, some kind of an issue, it's, it's up to you to not focus on, wow, this, this is an issue, this is terrible, you know, like what's going to happen, when it's just you in the woods, the only thing you can do is stand up, so figure out a solution and try it, and maybe it doesn't work, and then you have to, all you can do is try another solution, you know, and, and just constantly create and innovate and and I think even in, in maintaining our culture, as much as we want to like hang on to the past, we also have to create and innovate and realize that it's also dynamic. And, and um, uh, yeah, I don't know how long I have, but, I, but th those are kind of the thoughts that mm -hmm. I have that, that correlate. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, the Assyrian culture is amazing, and the more that we can lean into the beauty of it, the more that we can make it attractive to each other, and to, you know, the, uh, the more we can enrich each other and make a community, you know, the more, uh, the more that's going to be a proactive solution for the future, yeah. you know, and I just, anyway. We maintain the resilience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We stay resilient, and then we yeah, there are times where you're like huddled mm -hmm. up defense mode, but it's important to also come out of that in yeah. attack mode. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Killing a wolverine, that's what he did that. So look up the videos. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, th I think it's, it's a, a beautiful sentiment, sentiment um, that we, we have to be resilient. We have to, to ensure, you know, as my name said, that we're that they, they aren't successful, that the, those mm -hmm. that are against us are, are not successful, and we maintain that through our culture and through pres perseverance. Um, right. I think I'll, I'll finish off here with Medium. You know, uh, you said some really powerful things today, and I, I, I've loved hearing every minute <laughs> of it. I'm, I'm not the best Oprah because I'm, <laughs> I'm also engaged. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a great point. No, so you're a great Oprah. <laughs> <You're a great laughs> Thank you. Um, but before we go into to Q and A and giving you all a response, I did want to hear just a little bit more about you know, uh, you know seeing how genocide has driven so many of us into diaspora, um, you know, away from our ancestral lands, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, what does this mean for our identity as an indigenous group? You know, how can one identify as indigenous in the diaspora in these other places that that we all exist in? So one thing we have to acknowledge is there is a very real threat to our existence in our ancestral homeland uh, because our numbers we saw earlier keep dwindling. Mm -hmm. So that is a very real threat. And indigeneity is land-based, it's place-based. So it does matter that we, are, that we are leaving our ancestral homeland and I'm not judging people who leave, obviously, right? They're trying to survive, but I'm just saying that if we all leave, then that does pose a very real threat to our existence. But I also really want to drive home the fact that indigeneity is a relational identity. What does that mean? It means that I only become indigenous when I am being colonized and the colonizer is imposing their identity over me and trying to turn me into what they are. And by doing that, they marginalize my identity or they erase, try to erase my identity or assimilate me. That's when I become indigenous. It's a very specific process, right? That's what tra this process by Arabs, Turks, Kurds, this process is what transforms Assyrians into indigenous peoples because we are experiencing this ongoing colonization. Otherwise, we'd just be Ashurae in Beth Nahrin. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't meet this political category of indigenous, right? So it's a binary relationship. It's in opposition, it, by its very nature, it is in opposition to this colonizing identity. It is, it is struggling against this identity and it is refusing this identity, right? 
that takes agency, right? Yes, we are undergoing a process of trauma and all this stuff, but when you said joy, I'm actually not surprised because joy is a revolutionary act that indigenous peoples every day, I call myself a Syrian, that's revolutionary, right? That's me saying I'm refusing to be called Kurd, even though there are very real structural uh, reasons for me to call myself that, right? They're, tr they're working really hard at getting us to be Kurdish, just like Iraq works really hard at, calling, at getting us to be Arab, right? So even in the diaspora, we are indigenous because we are resisting this colonization. And this guy was from Australia and he made a whole film about our experience and he took it around the world to show people. He was being his Assyrian self and that informed how he did what he does, which is make films, right? Assyrians do this every day. That's what Michael was talking about, our human capital, right? I could have studied anything else in political science. It's a very vast field, <laughs> right? But I chose to think about Assyrians, right? Even in the diaspora, the land remembers us. She doesn't forget us. When we go home, and that's why these Gishru trips are so phenomenal, because they allow you to go home to even have that connection even though you live in the diaspora and are not going to move home permanently but that give and take that relationship you have to the land that's maintained because the land remembers us i'll stop there yeah <laughs> it's beautiful thank you both again for for sharing you know your personal and your your you know amazing uh stories and, and viewpoints as well. I think it's, uh, it's a hard topic, you know, as I mentioned, you know, it's not fun to talk about. It's not something that people really in, in want to talk about all the time, but it's, it's vital. And I think, uh, as many mentioned, we're resilient people. We need to be resilient to, to push against this and sharing our stories and talking about things like the impacts of, of genocide and our family stories are key to doing that. You know, it, it informs how you live your everyday life and understanding those stories helps us uh, know how powerful our ancestors were and how resilient they were and the things that happened to them are so important for us to, to keep their memory alive and to avoid any future genocides or the current genocides that are mm -hmm. happening to us and to continue to be resilient. Um, so I think we have some time for, for questions for Jordan and Mariam, if, if anyone would like to ask. We have a runner coming. <laughs> All right, so this question is for Jordan himself. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has seen the Alone series. I binged it. Uh, this guy had like icicles in his beard, uh, <laughs> eating rabbits, like protecting his food and stuff. So I was just curious, um, how do you think being a Syrian impacted your ability to perform on the show, to fight adversity, and you know, just to overcome the challenges you had on the show? Um, yeah, I, I mean, a good question. I, I touched on a little bit earlier, but just. It's so important to have perspective. Um, it's amazing to see, you know, you, I, I was curious when I got out, I was like, wow, it ended at 77 days. Like, what happened to everybody else? You know, like, and I, I was curious to go watch the show and see, and then you see, like, oh, man, it's easy to lose perspective when you're going through a struggle of some sort. And, and being a Syrian and kind of being, you know, bathed in those stories from a young age, I kind of just always had a perspective on whatever I was going through and um, it just allowed me to endure it really really focusing so much more on what I had than what I didn't have you know so much gratitude to for every rabbit that I was able to catch or every every positive thing as opposed to really focus and focusing on what was there were also very you know getting my fat stolen or getting this that or you know there's there's a lot of things you can go either way, but when you're like, man, you know, compared to what <laughs> dad, grandma, grandpa went through, it's just nothing to complain about. And I, I, I just, 
and and it is those lessons again and then very it was, they're very tangible to me but the lessons of enduring suffering with a joy and like leaning into the joy uh that's kind of deep in us is um is really important and i think that's fed by having the gratitude and all that just is played into uh, our Assyrian identity if we you know if we choose to lean on those aspects of it but i uh yeah, it played a big role. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mariam, I would like to personally thank you for all you do. Uh, you are so eloquent in how you articulate some Impressive. of the most important things academically. Um, I would like to remind you and inform everyone when I had invited you as a speaker to uh, CSU Stanislaus and Turlock for the Assyrian Genocide Remembrance Day. And again, your comments were so powerful and profound. And I wanna tell you, when we invite non-Assyrians to these events, when we invite members of the Sikh community who have suffered and are suffering a genocide, the Hmong community, the Asians, we had invited veterans who heard your comments for the first time, who said, Carmen, we have defended your churches in your ancestral homeland. And my second comment has to do with, I'm so appreciative to you for mentioning mental health. That brief movie that we saw, I know there were so many things in that scene, but my heart is with the little girl in the closet because I work with refugees who come to our region that are being resettled. And we want them to know we have an obligation. I have a personal obligation, and I know many of us in this room do. And we all have different talents of how we can help the continuity of the survival of our refugees, whether they're immigrants, whether they're refugees, asylum seekers, whether they're young as that little girl in the closet, or they are um, parents of our parents. Remember you said we're the ones who answer the phone, read the letters. But also, how do we find that? How do we fight the stigma? How do we reduce and eliminate the stigma that has to do with this intergenerational trauma of what our nation goes through? And when someone like you or that panel, uh, all of you, everyone who's spoken in, in this wonderful conference, Please keep talking about it. Let's find a way to improve the quality of life of those Assyrians who are settled, not just in America, but everywhere where they find peace and refuge. Thank you. Uh, if you have a question. Yeah, okay. a few hands over there. I'll be back on this. <laughs> okay. If we can try and keep them brief, please, just because we've only got a few minutes left. Hello, my name's Sarah. I, it's less of a question, more of a comment. Um, Miriam, you said the land remembers us. So I just went on the Geishu trip and one of my biggest takeaways was how much like I felt connected to the land, which was truly an out-of-body experience for me. And my mom's family's from Urmia. Like, growing up, I was like, okay, it's this faraway place. It's in Iran now, blah, blah, blah. So I never associated with being from Iraq. But when I was there, I was like, oh, this is my homeland. I am from here, like I felt that. I really can't put words to it and I think about it like every day. It's really magical, so I appreciate you saying that. That's amazing. <laughs> Hi. Oh. Okay, so I have a question. I mean, both of you could answer it, but it's more uh, directed at Miriam because I'm forgetting the source and I hate when that happens, but <laughs> I read it somewhere where it was like this expectation that America will decolonize Iraq for Assyrians is set on an erroneous premise because that would, like a colonizer nation can't decolonize a nation because then that would set a precedent for its, the delegitimization of America's place as America, you know, like our right. own claim to the land of America, our as in Americans here, not Assyrians. But um, I was thinking about that, and um, I can't think of an example of a decolonized nation. So when you, like, do you think the Assyrian struggle for, like, land rights can exist in a microcosm where it has to be a greater structure of decolonization? Because if there's no example of it, are, are we existing in, like, 
I, I mean, I guess I'm phrasing this wrong. It's more like, does it have to be a part of a greater struggle of decolonization because how can it exist isolated when there's no precedent? Okay, should I answer or should I wait for? No, okay. Answer, yeah. um, <laughs> thank you for that question. I, so there's two pieces of what I'm hearing you say. So there, decolonization is something that is globally necessary and the reason why Global, the reason why decolonization struggles or movements come together is because they are stronger together. They can learn from each other and the, each other's struggles, and they can stand in solidarity with each other, right? And move beyond the state in order to decolonize. The state is not actually going to decolonize itself by itself. That's not a thing in my opinion. Uh, so that's one. But there are examples of decolonization, right? So you have an entire continent who de underwent decolonization, formal, decol like when there was formal colonization of Africa, they decolonized, right? Um, to not be under colonial rule anymore. So that's one, so there's different definitions of what we're talking about here. But I'll give you an example of a modern day. So right now there's a nation, I forget which one, there's a nation that just won a land claim of land back in Canada, right? That's decolonization, right? So decolonization is local. You can do these things when you fight for them. We have so much to learn from other indigenous groups around the world, but especially where we live. We all live in places where we can learn from indigenous nations there about their struggles, because that will tell us something about our own struggles, but it will also tell us about how we can come together and decolonize. But that does happen, there are examples, it's just not always widespread. So we really have to do that work of, of looking for it and then actually finding these people and, the, and making those connections and relations. I found the discussion so far very enlightening and something that had uh, jogged my memory when we were talking about the land uh, I've had several discussions with other friends and colleagues about this, fellow Assyrians, and we find that it's important that we concentrate on making Atra a place where people are comfortable living in, because if our numbers continue to dwindle, no one takes us seriously over there. We have no power, no land. And um, what are your thoughts on what can be done to make it a place that people would not leave, uh, number one. And two, do you find that an emphasis on buying and protecting land from people in the diaspora to help the Nineveh Plains or other villages expand so that we can have a place back home? Not only to visit, but to protect and, and call ours. So there are people far better situated to answer this question than me in this very room, like Dr. Michael Uesh, like <laughs> Savina over there who actually lived in Atra for until a few years ago. Um, I will say that uh, the struggle for land is very key. And we really have to do everything in our power here to support land struggles back there. The fact that we're we're thinking about buying our own land back that was stolen from us, that to me sounds like a very broken system and not, and not always sustainable. But I do think that we really need to support the endeavors, whether they be helping those, uh, those back home buy back their land that was stolen or in other ways, because they back home are, are struggling to get back land that was stolen or to maintain their land. So the most important thing we can do is actually listen to them and what they're saying they want done and then supporting that. But like Michael said, find people who are actually working not under the auspices of the KRI or the KDP or the Badr or whoever else, people who are actually working for Assyrians in the Assyrian name. That's very important, right? Not getting caught up in all of these political games that happen, but actually finding Assyrians who are working for Assyrians. And that's why talking to someone like Savina would be 
really enlightening because she would tell you people on the ground or someone like Michael. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, so my comments are to uh, Dr. Mario. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I think it's really important to uh, really listen to what you you know what you spoke. And uh, but just to add on that, um, I had a question in mind. I mean, you know, to myself and you know to everybody, and you know maybe it's a question slash comment. Um, we have to. I noticed, you know, I since yesterday and today, and not, I mean, just in general, as being a Syrian in our Assyrian community, um, mainly and mostly, we tend to not mention the name of our land. So, a lot of us, you know, we call it Atra, Atrat Awahate, uh, homeland, our motherland, but we always almost most of the time fail to uh, mention the name which is Assyria because we are called Assyrians because of the land yes the land is important is very important and I mentioned that you know when, they, when we were speaking about the uh, you know what to define how to define your identity and it is from the land it comes from the land um, our land was called Mat Ashur in ancient Assyria which means the land of Ashur, the land of Assyria, or Assyria. So we have to be very specific and not be shy to mention that name because we are Assyrians, we come from Assyria. It's not Iraq, it's not Syria, it's not Iran or Lebanon or any other country. Um, we have to know that Assyria, we are indigenous to Assyria and only Assyria. Uh, just so we don't get confused. I mean, I hope everybody does his, you know, their due, dil due diligence in studying their history, just to know that any other country um, outside of the borders of Assyria, which is the Assyrian Triangle today, uh, is, is considered diaspora for us. Even Iraq, even Syria, even Lebanon, even any other country in the Middle East. Mm. Assyria, we are only indigenous to Assyria. Thank you. I'll do you one better. <laughs> so when we say Assyria, that's in English. When I write, I call it Bithnaharen, because that's what it's called in our language. Ashur. Ashur, right? Ashur. So when we're talking, I think it's really important to use our own language to call our places by that name. And even in an English context, you could still say Ashur, you could still say Bithnaharen, you could still use those words and then just say what they mean instead of Mesopotamia or the land between two rivers or Iraq or whatever. And if you do have to use Iraq or Turkey, so-called Iraq, what's today called as Iraq, if you notice me saying, right? Because it is known as that today, but that doesn't make it legitimate. Thanks. Uh, we can take one more, but a question, please. No comments. <laughs> Uh, thank you to both of you for your testimonies today. It's been super interesting. Um, my question is to one of you or either of you, whoever wants to answer it, but I think a lot of us struggle with this sort of dual identity of some of us that were born here in America that we are also Assyrian, but we're also sort of, and this came up earlier, Assyrian American. So I guess to both of you, how do you balance sort of having sort of these two identities or do you not? Do you prefer to have, I just want to know your thoughts on that. Like, do you prefer to kind of make Assyrian most of your identity or like what exactly goes into that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we all, we all try to struggle with it, right? Um, that are, have that mixed identity. But um, I, I lean pretty heavily into the Assyrian side with, a, with an asterisk. But uh, to say what I was saying earlier, there's a um, I see what I see the Assyrian community, especially in the diaspora, like defined in a certain way. Like uh, we've talked about a little bit with a few of that I've talked with, but everybody lives in Chicago or LA or what. <laughs> but I know my grandfather came from a rural area in Iraq. And so it's like I kind of uh, appreciate the opportunity to. Um, show Assyrians who identify as Assyrians living in a slightly different way than is typical for the diaspora. So, um, 
we can all, we're, it, you're still an Assyrian if you <laughs> have your animals and live on <laughs> land, which is probably what many of them do back in the place. So uh, I, I, you know, so that's an important part, but it goes just to what I was speaking with earlier, that we also have to create a little bit and create mm -hmm. an add to our community that is fellow Assyrians and um, be a part of that project of developing. Can I add something to this? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question, especially for those of us who might have spent more of our lives here than on our homeland or born here. I would invite you not to be afraid of fragmentation. Mm -hmm. Our identities are fragmented, right? I couldn't give you a talk in, in my specialization, like a formal talk in Assyrian, mm -hmm. but I could definitely have a conversation with you in Assyrian, I, right? Um, my, my identity is fragmented along three languages, right? I'm not perfect at English, I'm not perfect at Arabic, I'm not perfect at Assyrian, but I speak all three of them, and all three of them shape my worldview, mostly Assyrian because it was my mother tongue. But you see what I'm saying? Like all of our identities are fragmented, and that's okay. That just means you are surviving colonization. But our identities are also have other intersectionalities, which I would also invite you to think about, right? So our ethnicity as Assyrian is one thing, but then I'm also a woman. I'm also racialized in my new location of being in Canada, right? For the first time in my life, I was brown. Before that, I was Assyrian, right? So there are, uh, their identities are always shifting and fragmentation happens and that's okay. You are still who you are, right? And you can, you can bring all of those together. You can be Assyrian if you're born here. You can be Assyrian if you grew up here, even if you don't speak Assyrian perfectly. You can learn that when you're old. I just talked to someone who said they learned Assyrian at 18 years old. That's incredible, <laughs> right? So I just, fragmentation is also part of survival. Mm -hmm. okay. And really quickly, oh, we just have one more question. Sorry, I lied. It's a good one, so. <laughs> um, Jordan, you had an experience with uh, indigenous peoples in Siberia. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And Mariam, and obviously we're all indigenous, and Mariam, you have an expertise and also experience working with indigeneity across the globe as an issue. Can each of you comment on your sense of what allyship and solidarity is with others and then what, how you see it reciprocating back to Assyrians? Well, that's a good, that's a very good question. I, um, of course, I spent a lot of time living with, right, an indigenous group, these Avenki people, and it's a really cool culture. I really appreciated it. And it has its own issues. You know, they have their own issues that are really struggling. And it feels like 1880s in America, where with the Native Americans, we just think, is it going to survive or not their way of life? And I really hope it does. And my, I would try to, you know, be an ally to them in the best way that I could. And, and that was mostly trying to, oh, it goes to your question earlier, how do you make the homeland attractive, right? And I, I thought the same thing, like, boy, they're kind of in an uncanny valley where in Russia, nobody appreciates their culture, but they have to, uh, but if they can just get over this little hump, I'm sure that people are going to see how beautiful their culture is and for what it is. And so I would just try to like maybe encourage them to, uh, you know, if they could develop economically slightly, um, and to where they could sell their hides or invite people to join in on their culture and like tour around. And, you know, so I would try to facilitate those things and think, because what I, one thing I did see and one thing I appreciate for all of you who are um, bringing forward a Syrian culture is um, that those that are disconnected from it in Russia, that from the Evenki culture, lived lives that were much... They never integrated well into the Russian society, but then they didn't have their Evenki culture. And so it kind of left them a little bit lost. But in, uh, around those villages where there was a reindeer herding traditional culture still for them to relate to, everybody thrived. Even the people that weren't reindeer herders because they had that to tap into. They could take pride in the fact that, oh, these, are, these people are doing that. They could go, you know, like we might go visit the homeland or something, they could go and spend a summer with the herders out there. And so uh, all that to say, uh, it's hard, it, at the, on the nitty gritty, it is hard to know how to be a good ally sometimes and you have to try to not cause more harm than good and do all, you know, all the thoughtfully be an ally. But um, 
but, but I, it's really appreciated. I know they've told me that, you know, like the, even in my clumsy, just, I was just some guy over there, you know, but I just do my best to try to be a part and like a loving relationship with these people I really care for. That's all you can do in an allyship mm -hmm. and try to express love for others, you know? So if you actually have a heart for, what we're speaking and allying, I guess, with other people, then that, that a genuine care for those people, which is facilitated by relationships and stuff. Yeah. But then how can others be great allies to us? <laughs> <laughs> I did have a quick follow-up, though. Um, did you share your stories with them? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Side? Tell them about yeah. I was like, hey, we're indigenous too, mm -hmm. you know, because <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're talking we're a lot about that. the importance of sharing our oral history with our own people, and you know, you can share well, that with, with yeah, them as well. Yeah, they like to hear that too. You know, it's like they like to. Yeah. Yep. I think this is such an important question. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking it. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to try to be really brief. Um, <laughs> In all of my work, I've come across and heard the stories of many uh, indigenous people, and they're all from di in different indigenous nations. And they all have their own particularities and their own ideologies and their own whatever. But one thing we have in common is this experience of colonization and all that it has entailed. And I mean, colonization is not a thing by itself that is underpinned by many other structures like racism, like class, right? Like these are not separate things. So I really wanna echo what you were saying because allyship and solidarity is about making connections and building real meaningful relations that have to be guided by a genuine care and love, right? So not thinking about what you can do for me, but thinking about looking around and seeing everyone who has something in common with you, right? And thinking, how can we make these uh, connections in order to overthrow these structures that are oppressing us? We don't have to agree on everything, but we need to agree that there is class oppression. Racial capitalism is a thing. We need to agree on that. It's destroying our planet and it's just destroying our indigenous way of life. And we are being colonized to steal resources and land, <laughs> right? We have to agree that the indigenous experience includes the, our racialization into this other, whether it's black, brown, whatever, right? We're being racialized as indigenous peoples and we have something in common with other indigenous peoples and other racialized peoples. We don't need to be the same as them, but we have a common experience. And when we come together and build those links, instead of being very separate, then we can overthrow these structures. Because at the end of the day, the only way we will actually decolonize and liberate ourselves is by dismantling and overthrowing these structures. So I'll stop here. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you all for for the thoughtful questions, and thank you again to our panelists. Um, they'll be here, so if anyone has further questions, obviously, I'm throwing you guys under the bus, but feel, feel free to go up to them and ask oh. them. <laughs> um, and then just to add, like, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I, I mean, since I have an Instagram that I would be really happy to hear from any of you on about anything. So Amazing. if you want to go on an adventure in the wilderness. <laughs> Yes, please. Really and I think we'll be sharing videos from alone. We'll oh. send out <laughs> some, some links uh, so you can watch our famous panelists uh, in the wilderness, which will be awesome. And Mariam, anything you have to share as well, please send it our way. We'll share well, with I do everyone. have a Twitter and a Facebook and an Instagram, yeah. but um, I don't Genuine. go on Twitter often, but I am on there. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to say thank you so much yeah. for having me here and for being such an engaging audience. It was absolutely Amazing. my pleasure and honor to be with you today. Huge honor. Okay. Yep, thank you, guys.